Hey there, welcome to Startup Steroid. Today I'm interviewing Jeff Wallace. Um, he's a fantastic angel investor, has tons of experience, has been associated with a lot of really big um, angel groups, uh, including Berkeley Angel Group, um, I believe Battery, Sand Hill, um, and uh, now he's starting his own company. Um, he's the co-founder of uh, Silicon Valley in Your Pocket which is a fantastic initiative to help entrepreneurs and uh, help them learn more about the business world, how to raise capital, uh, about marketing strategy, lots of different things. So we're going to touch on all of that today. Uh, but a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the interview. First, if you like content like this, make sure you click the subscribe button. That's really important for us, especially now that we're starting to grow. Uh, we need those subscribers uh, and uh, that helps us uh, improve our targeting, improve uh, um, YouTube formulation, all of those things. So please subscribe. Um, second is that if you're an angel investor and are looking to join our network, uh, we don't sell you anything. We just provide you with additional deal flow. So you get to look at more companies, you get to look at more opportunities to invest. And every once in a while, we have bonus videos where we actually uh, help you learn about angel investing. Uh, so if you're interested in that kind of content, make sure you email me. My email address is on the screen now, and it'll be on the screen again uh, at the end of the video. And it's also in the descriptions. Uh, so make sure you click uh, the, that email address and just send me a quick note. Angel investor interested in joining your network and uh, we'll get you connected um, and uh, uh, we'll start sending you more deal flow. So that's one. Uh, second item is uh, if you're an entrepreneur, and if you're looking to raise money for your company and are looking for uh, looking to meet investors and uh, 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 meet mentors, um, then uh, definitely join our database uh, and we'll get you connected with the right resources. Um, you can do that by going to startupsteroid.com and click on the founder button. That's again, startupsteroid.com founder. And when you click on that founder button, you'll get a little form that you need to fill out. Uh, fill that out, send it in, and we'll be in touch with you and get you added to our database. Uh, so those are the two main things. Um, get connected to our database and uh, our network. And number two is subscribe to uh, this channel. So this way you can make sure you always, keep, uh, always get content like this. Having said all of that, let's get into the interview with Jeff Wallace and uh, uh, learn everything that he has to teach us. Thanks. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, we're gonna talk about your background, uh, how you're helping entrepreneurs, um, and then we'll also get into a little bit of your history with investing in startups and maybe talk about some portfolio companies uh, that you already, you've already invested in. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that we can touch on today. So I'm excited. So let's get into it. Tell me a little bit about your background and uh, you know, how you sort of ended up where you are today. Sure. And thanks for having me. I'm excited to have this conversation with you as well. I know we've spoken about setting it up and I've been thinking about it since we had that conversation. So I'm glad we're here now. It's awesome. So uh, originally, I'm from the East Coast. I grew up in uh, New York, New Jersey area, mostly grew up in Jersey, born in New York, mostly grew up in Jersey. And then I worked on Wall Street after my college years, which I studied economics and finance. And after a few years on Wall Street, I decided, you know, I'll go back and get a graduate degree. And I thought since I'd done everything on the East Coast, generally around my hometown, let me uh, let me go out to the West Coast and try it for two years. Well, last month, July of, uh, of 2020, was 30 years I've been out here now. <laughs> uh, essentially, I'm not sure if I'm a Californian by now. I've been out here more than half my life now. Uh, <laughs> but I just got caught up in the whole entrepreneurial and uh, the spirit of entrepreneurship and technology. And um, I'm, I'm very focused in those areas. I kind of studied those things in my MBA program with strategy, technology, and entrepreneurship. And so I just kind of got caught up in the Silicon Valley, San Francisco Bay Area ecosystem. And despite the first five years of my career being in management consulting with large corporations uh, as a consultant to those companies, I, uh, after five years of doing that, I jumped into the entrepreneurial uh, pools, if you will, 
And that's where I've been pretty much ever since. I did a very short stint back out of that in 2011. But from mid-90s until 2011, for 16 years, I was a serial entrepreneur with some good businesses and some terrible businesses. I kind of spanned the spectrum. Fortunately, it's, uh, it's, it leaned on the good side overall. Then in 2011, I got recruited by Cognizant um, back into this kind of large enterprise world where I ran and started their enterprise mobility practice. So it was actually more intrapreneurial in a big company being a very entrepreneurial kind of person that I was. We were able to get that practice off the ground. It was very, very fun and exciting for a couple of years. But I like to say I got reminded uh, about two years in why I prefer working with earlier stage <laughs> startups and so i resigned out of that uh, role and and uh, shortly thereafter jumped back into helping entrepreneurs and rather than being an entrepreneur again i thought it's time for maybe uh, i'm at a stage of my life and my career where maybe i can help other entrepreneurs and so i've started a couple of startup accelerators now uh, which i still am heavily involved in um, as well as just working with entrepreneurs from all over the world so it's it's very exciting for me. I get to see a lot of really creative and innovative entrepreneurs from everywhere. That's fantastic. And now you're, or I guess you have been for the last 30 years, you have been in the Silicon Valley area. So I think you're in Berkeley now, but you're very familiar with that San Francisco uh, uh, entrepreneurship scene, I guess. Uh, is that? that absolutely. That's about right. Okay. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. I, I, you know, when you're in the Bay Area, um, you learn about the traffic because your meetings are everywhere. So exactly. I'm down in the Valley, I'm in San Francisco, I'm here in the East Bay in Berkeley, Oakland. So, you know, even like tomorrow, I'm heading down to Santa Clara for one of my very first meetings out of my, my home, uh, meeting with a, cl a prospective client for one of the startups I'm an investor and an advisor within. So um, nice. we'll get into some details about that. But yeah, yeah, uh, definitely span the entire spectrum of the Silicon Valley Bay Area. That's fantastic. And do you go back to the East Coast at all? You know that I'm from New York also, so we have that in common. But uh, do, you, do you still have an, an, any roots back there or now are you completely on the West Coast? No, no. Personally, I've been on the West Coast for, like I said, 30 years and a little bit more now. Um, but my <laughs> family is all back there. And so I get back there very regularly. I have a lot of friends back in the New York area still, uh, Philadelphia, New Jersey. So, yeah, I kind of get back to that kind of uh, section of the East Coast fairly regularly. And listen, New York's such an amazing city and an amazing place. And New Jersey's where I'm from. And I've got a lot of roots there and yep. still connections there. So always enjoy my opportunity to get back there. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and same for me, right? I, it, it's always such a great sort of flashback to go back. And that, by the way, that's my background. It, it, it's sort of that nostalgia, right? Connection to New York and yep. that fast paced life. But uh, I guess uh, there's something about the West Coast that the, the entrepreneurial spirit, I think, is just really unique. Um, it's very different. It is very different. I think New York has its own entrepreneurial fever. Um, you know, they call it the Silicon Alley. And, and I do buy, I buy into that. There is a, a different entrepreneurial thing that's happening there. But, you know, it's very hard to rival what I'm living within here in the Silicon Valley Bay Area. It's just uh, it's kind of a mecca for the startup ecosystem. Absolutely. And I would say that even more so than just within the U.S. I would say almost on a global basis, the Silicon Valley Bay Area has this allure to it for startup mm -hmm. culture. And it's not hard to understand why when you think about the biggest companies and technologies we use, many of those were are companies based right here. Absolutely. They started here. They grew up here. So, yeah, that, that, that's yeah. that's in the air, as someone would call it. So let's Absolutely. talk a little bit more about that. Um, I want to talk about your experience starting these accelerators and what you're doing today. So tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So back in 2015, when I really exited the uh, kind of corporate life again that I had gotten pulled back into temporarily, um, I got introduced to a group that was forming um, it's an entity called the Batchery, like a batch of cookies. Mm -hmm. And the Batchery was a local, more traditional accelerator with co-working for our startups and everything was done in, you know, within our confines of our space, our physical space. We had the entrepreneurs come meet up every, whatever the schedule was, every Tuesday, you know, at, at 11 a.m. we would run our classes or whatever the, the specific schedule was. It was much more of a traditional accelerator. And I was very fortunate. I had a lot of amazing uh, co-founders. There was a group of us, uh, angel investors, essentially, that collectively formed the battery. And myself and one other gentleman by the name of Cal Deutsch, um, he and I were asked essentially to co-lead. So we took on the executive responsibilities within 
kind of operating roles uh, of the battery. And during our first few cohorts, we kind of got things going. We've already completed now 10 cohorts. We've had about a, close to 150 uh, um, companies that are graduates and we're gonna, we are in a recruitment mode of our 11th cohort. So that's been an amazing journey and uh, amazing experience. As I said earlier, we get to meet so many interesting entrepreneurs. But a few years ago, I met an entrepreneur who had relocated from South Africa. And he was, uh, he had done a stint in your old town, New York, my old hometown. Then yeah. he found his way to the Bay Area and we ended up meeting. And what I learned was he was one of many foreign founders that I meet that had spent a lot of money getting to the U.S. and in particular getting to the Silicon Valley. And, you know, relatively speaking, New York or San Francisco area where he had lived are the two most expensive. You know, you could argue which is first, but they're first and second yep. most expensive cities in the U.S. And I thought, wow, these foreign founders who are coming from lesser developed um, countries, that's a really... Uh, expensive undertaking, moving from where they live, coming to the U.S., living in these expensive cities with resources they don't have really to spare. And I just thought in meeting him, I thought, why don't we have mechanisms to accelerate these foreign founders and their businesses where they are before they expend all of that capital and all that resource? And if they get strong enough, then come over. I mean, in a much more strength, you know, position of strength. Right. And so I reached into my coat pocket and I pulled out my mobile phone and I said, you know, if you have one of these, uh, it's kind of like having Silicon Valley in your pocket. You shouldn't need to uproot yourself and spend all that resource. You should be able to accelerate there and hopefully strengthen. And long story short, he became a co-founder of a business entitled Silicon Valley in your pocket. And we launched about a year or so later. We launched, and I did pull in my colleague, Cal, from the battery. So right. Cal, and the other gentleman's name is Callie, uh, the <laughs> three of us. So I like to keep it easy for myself. The three of us uh, <laughs> became co-founders and launched Silicon Valley in Your Pocket. And now we've serviced over 100 companies from 23 countries. And we have a formal partnership with UC Berkeley for a Spanish language version of our program. So it's been an amazing Fantastic. journey between the two. And I still work very closely with the battery companies. I'm not... Um, it, there's not one or the other to me. I get, you know, I'm fortunate that I get to spend time with entrepreneurs that are participating in both programs. Right. And, and I, I know a little bit about, you know, Silicon Valley in your pocket, and I know they have resources as well as live coaching and Q and A's and things like that. So that, that, that really is a Silicon Valley in your pocket, right? You're, you are giving them a lot of access to you, to other coaches and mentors that you have on the platform, as well as, uh, you know, giving them a little bit of a, a little taste of what it's like to be in the Bay Area. So I, I think yeah. that's a fantastic initiative. Yeah, it's a great program. Um, we get a lot of very positive feedback on it. It's essentially a three month program that is a combination of on demand, self paced curriculum, combined with live group coaching or group office hour uh, calls, similar to what we're doing here on Zoom. Right. And then we also give each member a, a personalized tailored investor deal room so that when an investor expresses some interest, they can simply send them a link to their deal room and everything is kind of laid out nicely and intuitively, very much the way an investor would be interested to review it. That's fantastic. Even just that last resource, I think it's worth its weight in gold, right? Because uh, investors want it easy, want it straightforward when they're talking to an entrepreneur and they don't want to keep asking for more information, send thousand emails just to get, you know, the basic fundamentals of what you would probably need. Uh, well, to, you just, to your you just hit it. You hit the nail on the head, Deval, because I always say to somebody, when an investor says, I'm interested, can you send me more information? And the yeah. next thing they get is, here, please type your email in here and you copy in the link to your deal room. Before you've said one word to them beyond that, they are thinking, wow, this entrepreneur is on top of their game. They are well put together. They understand. And exactly. that sends a message with no words. And so we try to make it so that they can appear to be um, not just appear to be, but that they are on top of their game, have all the information that an investor would be interested to review in considering the due diligence for an investment. Um, when you can do that, I mean, it tells something to an investor before you've ever had your first discussion with them about the information itself. Exactly. And, and yeah, I, I want to actually go into a little bit more about entrepreneurs and uh, what you look for in companies, but that, that's such a fantastic resource, right? That, that's how you want every single entrepreneur to be 
professional on top of their game, you know, uh, and, and responsive, right? So it's not like, oh, let me think about that pitch book and that pitch deck that I created three months ago. Is it still yeah. relevant? Do I need to update? No, it's just, here's one link. You have all the resources right there in one shot. Absolutely. It's all folders intuitive to here's our legal documents, here's our employment agreements, here's our partnership agreements, here's our financial model, here's our go to market strategy. You know, it's all just okay. laid right out there in separate folders that an investor can go down. We provide all of our entrepreneurs with a very comprehensive checklist and templates for every item in our checklist so that they know at least it's a head start, a jump starter, if you will, to get right. them to the information with their content and then to put it in a format that the investors will be kind of compelled by. Fantastic. Fantastic. So uh, let's transition into talking about those uh, entrepreneurs and the startups. Um, and uh, I know you do the, uh, you provide the, that level of sort of professionalism through Silicon Valley in your pa pocket, but let's say someone has not go gone through their, that program then what do you look for in a startup to actually start your due diligence? If you even want to spend, you know, 10 minutes looking at it, what, what, what's sort of going through your mind when someone approaches you? You know, I always say that uh, as an investor, I'm interested in a few key things. Um, some of them are probably very common to other investors. I'm sure in most cases, many of them are, but I certainly look for a very compelling team. And I say team because I don't want a solopreneur, as I would call an individual founder. Um, to me, the challenge of a solopreneur is succession plan. I, I, uh, I crudely call it the Greyhound bus syndrome. If we're meeting mm -hmm. in a coffee shop, we finish our meeting and you step off the curb and a Greyhound bus runs you over, my investment is gone because there right. is no succession plan to carry the torch forward for the business, which is really what I'm investing in. So solo entrepreneurs or solopreneurs, as I say, very challenging. So I look for a really solid team where they do have at least um, someone who could carry the torch in a, an eventuality of, a, of one of the co-founders, maybe the CEO person, uh, if they were not able to you know, go forward with the business for any reason. I still want to see that the business itself can go forward. So looking at those kinds of credible teams, I have a host of other uh, kind of definitions, if you will, of what a credible team is. <laughs> but I also look for not just a large market. Everybody thinks, oh, if I have the X billion dollar market and I get a small percent of it, I'm a, I'm a very successful company. Um, I, don't, I don't like that. I like to see entrepreneurs who have done kind of that ground up three year forward, you know, bottoms up, if you will, financial forecast to show me that they've actually thought through the steps. I think it's very lazy to say it's a $10 billion market. And if we get 1%, we're a $100 million company. Right. Um, it's, that doesn't tell me you actually know how to do that. So a bottoms up three year forecast is something I look for. I want people to be able to show me what are you going to do next month, next quarter, next six months, next 12, next 24 months to get that market share that you're going to get. And it shouldn't just be a large market, but I actually would prefer, I, in all ideal scenarios, a large and still growing market. Mm -hmm. A contracting market isn't as attractive to me, obviously, even in a large market. If it's contracting, that's less attractive to me. Right. And then, you know, the most important thing of all, beyond those which are important, is traction. Traction to me, and I know traction is a, is a bit of a challenging term because it means different things when people say it. What I mean by traction is it shows that somebody is, is, re, is realizing the promise you as the entrepreneur offer them. If you say when you use my widget, you're going to get these kinds of outcomes, I want to speak to someone who's actually receiving those kinds of outcomes, or at least in a pilot test to show that you're right. moving in the direction. Visibility to realizing those outcomes is still sufficient, but at least show me it's beyond a concept and if you do have some degree of traction, the capital you're seeking is, in many cases, scale capital, not mm. validation capital. Those right. are big differences to me as an investor. Absolutely. So true that, you, you know, even if you are pre-revenue, you want to have at least some users on the platform. You want to see that they're actually reaching out to new users and see if they, what kind of responses they're getting. So absolutely right with that. Um, and... and just uh, to back up one more step, I think, hang on one second. Sorry, I just got a message sure. saying that uh, my internet was unstable, so. Okay. Okay, all right. So uh, 
just, just to back up, um, I also want to talk about that, you know, the Greyhound bus uh, scenario that you just talked about. And there are yeah. a lot of people that uh, I've spoken to, they instead of a founder, they actually want co-founders, right? So if something happens to one, then the other can take over. And then exactly. there's a whole other camp that says, you know, if you have co-founder, that's a, eventually that's a recipe for disaster because they're gonna, there's gonna be infighting and issues with that. So there, there's a whole camp that wants single uh, uh, entrepreneur or single founder on the company. What's your view on those two camps? Uh, do you have a preference? Uh, oh, I have a definitive preference. Definite preference for me is co-founders. Co and maybe okay. you put an agreement, a shareholders or a founders agreement together that says in the eventuality of some founder, you know, wants to leave, how it will, ha how it will be transacted with regard to their equity position, for right. example. Um, I think without a co-founder, listen, I have a co-founder in all my businesses, they're great sounding boards. I like to say everybody knows something, but nobody knows everything. And yep. so having a co-founder allows you to expand the collective something we all know. Mm -hmm. um, and so definitely I lean in on the co-founder side. I think the challenges of a co-founder that I don't, I don't um, disagree, there can be challenges, but I think those are easier to overcome than um, no succession plan to carry the torch of the business forward. Right, right, got it, okay. Um, so now let's talk about the companies that these guys are actually presenting to you. Uh, are there any specifics that you look for in a company, certain industries that you're, that you're more interested than less in interested? Uh, tell me your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm actually very much um, industry agnostic. Even myself, I have investments across a wide spectrum. Um, I generally try to invest in things that I understand. I'm not a scientist, so I don't invest in heavily scientific based uh, businesses, although I have pharma and bio businesses and uh, business investments. Generally speaking, I lean in on, you know, technology enabled businesses, enterprise oriented. I like businesses that have characteristics of recurring business models. Mm. Um, I like to see a business where every new dollar of revenue doesn't require a new customer and or a new transaction, but they could have that recurring nature. Um, mm. But industry, I, I don't have a specific focus. I, uh, I really do have a wide spectrum. And, and I know some people do kind of really narrow in on that. I keep a very open uh, attitude, even about things I don't know deeply. I still believe there's great opportunity. And, Sometimes I'll bring in a collaborative partner of mine that might have more knowledge of that space and leverage their knowledge to try to help in the due diligence phase. And, um, but I'll still be very open to investing in it. That's fantastic. Yeah, I know some uh, angels limit themselves to investing in only businesses that they understand, right? And, and what that, ha what, in my mind yeah. at least, what happens is you miss out on you know 80% of the opportunities that you may not necessarily understand but that are real opportunities, right? Um, yep. So you're, you're leaving a lot on the table by Absolutely. doing that. But I, I, I completely understand your... Hey, so with that approach, you said that, you know, you generally want to bring in, if, if it's an industry that you don't understand, you want to bring in someone who might have a better understanding. Um, tell me a little bit about what that looks like. And is it through the, this angel groups that you're part of? Uh, are, are there other people that, uh, you know, are also investing with you and you're sort of riding on their coattails if you don't necessarily understand the business. Is that the approach? Uh, tell me how you think about that. Yeah, no, great question. And I, um, I, I am part of a couple of angel groups. I'm a member, for example, I'm an alumni from Berkeley. So I'm part of the Berkeley Angel Network. It's a group of Berkeley affiliated folks who want to do it's angel a fantastic investing. group. Yep. Yeah. So I'm part of that group. Um, I, I'm also part of other angel groups and I'm very close to a lot of people in parts of other angel groups. So I kind of have a, I circle many of the, the um, larger angel groups around the Bay area. Many of my business partners, for example, in the battery are all different are parts of all different angel networks around here. Mm. So we have a lot of uh, tentacles into the broader angel network, which is wonderful. Um, I don't personally invest through angel groups myself. I invest independently. Um, I don't co-invest, but I do like, for example, I have two bioscience investments. I reached out to colleagues of mine who are far deeper knowledge uh, than I am in those spaces, asked them to review the information, speak to the uh, prospective investors that I was considering investing in. Um, and then on, uh, with information, from them, I either did or didn't make investments. In, in a couple Got of it. cases, I have. Um, 
And I also do, when I am part of angel groups, I will participate in the broader due diligence process and get mm -hmm. the benefit of that group think and that group processing of the due diligence information, group input. And then that just it better informs me. But I do make each individual uh, investment decision independently. That's that's so good because that's essentially my approach too, right? Being part of the uh, angel groups, and we've talked about this in the past, but uh, I'm part of Thai SoCal Angels and uh, other groups down here in Southern California. But essentially being part of those groups makes me smarter, right? And, and uh, learning from all of that, you know, that collective knowledge base uh, is always very helpful. So that that's a great idea and great thing that uh, new angels can do to essentially improve their knowledge of, you know, what this process looks like. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so let, let, let's talk about current events a little bit. I know, you know, we're in a global pandemic and, you know, things are sort of falling a, a apart uh, on the seams or maybe not even on the seams, but uh, has that changed your approach to investing and how you go through this process and how you um, meet entrepreneurs and, you know, the, the entire process? You know, it's interesting. My life used to be coffee shop meetings with prospective <laughs> entrepreneurs that either wanted to take an accelerator program, wanted an investment, something of the sort. Right. Now, of course, everything is remote. Uh, I'm not doing many, any real in-person meetings like that. What's, what I have noticed as a difference is I tell every entrepreneur to have what I call the COVID overlay slide in your pitch deck now. Mm -hmm. I don't care um, if COVID isn't dramatically impacting a business. Tell me what's happening with respect to COVID, because I think it's on the minds of investors is what does this new COVID uh, environment mean for this opportunity that I'm considering? So I think every entrepreneur should have their, as I call it, the COVID overlay slide. I have also been working with a few of my entrepreneurs to kind of pivot into COVID. Now, COVID is taking a big hit on a lot of companies. It's slowing down the investment community. They're taking a, a little bit of a hesitation or a pause, if you will, in, in, in the free flowing of funds. So mm -hmm. I think they have to have longer runways, make the, cut the burn rates down, you know, make sure you can sustain for a longer time without an infusion of new capital. So I'm working with entrepreneurs that I'm affiliated with or invested in or advising uh, on things like that. I've had a couple of entrepreneurs that have pivoted directly into the COVID situation and done remarkably well. Wow, uh, I hate great. to say that a crisis can become an advantage to some extent, but uh, that's there's an old expression, you know, never let a, a good crisis go to waste. Go right? to waste, yep. And, and so I've had one or two companies that have really taken COVID in a positive way. Um, listen, they, they, it's there whether you take it in a positive way or you don't. And Absolutely. one or two of the companies had done very, very well. Um, one of them actually had an appliance uh, that killed bacteria. Um, wow. They've now taken a pivot, and we're, um, with some collaboration from me and others, um, we're now working with uh, some very prominent people in the industry uh, doing virucidal testing to see if their appliance also kills the COVID-19 virus. All initial work that has been done to that effect, nothing finalized yet, but all initial indicators, and I mean all, indicate that it does in fact kill the COVID-19 virus. And that will Fantastic. change their channel. They've been ch channeling into um, sports markets for odor causing bacteria to help odors get mm. out of clothing and other, uh, other items. Now they're focusing on hygienics, cleanliness of virus, um, so we're targeting first responder markets. I mean, going after, hey, PPE oh, wow. yeah. in short supply, we can sanitize PPE, make sure it's clean for the next time you're having to reuse it because of the short supply. So much different markets, and they're doing spectacularly well in those areas. I have another company that does ride hailing. Well, ride hailing, particularly in Manhattan. Ride hailing in Manhattan is down dramatically, but she right. focuses on people who own pets in her business. And people with uh, pets are still going to the vets. And so she does pet only rides. So it's kind of like your pet is taking a, a ride hailing service. Yes. Um, that, that company is and doing. You know, I'm actually well. looking at that company also, and we might actually have her on, uh, on the show at one point. So that's fantastic. And I know she's doing great right now. So that, that's a great example. Yeah, so that's great. So I look for companies that can manage uh, the COVID scenario hopefully and sustain. I don't care if they thrive as long as they can survive it and hopefully yep. thrive in the post-COVID scenario. 
Um, but a few of them are actually thriving within it. And that's been very impressive for me to see the entrepreneurs be able to manage that and, and to find that, that lane. Because it's mm -hmm. not a clear lane in every scenario, but in right. these few examples, they've been able to find a lane to survive and thrive during the COVID. Yeah. And I think at, at this point, virtually every business has to find that lane, right? It, it, yeah. it, even if they're not a startup, let's say even if they are an established business, they have to figure out how they're going to operate in this new world. Um, and, and I think early on in this pandemic, I, I heard about one third of the companies are going to do fantastically well. They're going to, you know, really, they, you know, similar to Zoom and how it sort of exploded. Sure. Uh, and now, you know, everyone is doing this. Everyone is on Zoom calls. Um, when COVID started, about a third of the company will fall into that category. About a third of the company will be mm, not really affected, nothing better, nothing less. You know, is, they're more or less coasting. And about a third of the company are going to get destroyed. They're going to get crushed because they won't fit into the first two categories. Yeah. Um, is that sort of what, what you are seeing with your portfolio companies and what you're seeing in the world at large? You know, in general, it's, I believe in that comment. I think the third that is going to be most challenged are not the kind of businesses that I generally am dealing with. And what I mean mm. by that is they may be generally more lifestyle businesses. Mm. For example, a local business that's dependent on customer traffic. Well, that's mm. not generally the kind of what I would call in third party investor focused business. So right. mine, as I mentioned earlier, generally tend to be more tech enabled. Mm -hmm. And so those are the companies that have been able to kind of manage some form of a pivot. So my portfolio is probably not broken out into that same a third, a third and a third, only because of the nature of my investments. I don't generally invest in lifestyle businesses. I don't generally invest in service based businesses where it's all mm -hmm. about labor and people and personnel selling hours, if you will, or arbitraging hours or labor. Um, those businesses, I think, will be very, very challenged. Um, but, right. but my portfolio, fortunately, is uh, the majority of them, I think, will survive this pandemic. And as I said, a couple of them may actually do better uh, in this environment than they might have prior to it. That's fantastic. And I think you've set up a transition for me perfectly. So let me see if I can make this happen. Okay. But uh, the, the two camps of companies that you just mentioned, sort of lifestyle businesses, local businesses, are businesses that are not scalable, right? Um, and, and as investors, we want to see a company that can go from 100 users to 1,000 users to a million users, right? Um, so scalability when i'm looking at a company going through due diligence is really important and is something that i want to you know focus on and i want to see if the entrepreneur is focused on that also um how do you sort of view that in the companies you're investing in when you're going through the due diligence how are you looking at you know the company not just the product itself but the company the team um you know maybe even the financial systems they have in place see if they are scalable um, is that a critical part of due, due diligence? Do you focus on that or yeah. is that not much of a, a, a topic for you? No, I mean, earlier I gave an answer on a couple of important factors, but I, I certainly didn't mean for that to be all inclusive. Uh, right. You're touching on one for certain that I believe is, is critical, um, which is the scalability. I often use the expression, it has to have scale beyond border capabilities. Mm. And Border could be state, it could be country, it could be, you know, continent. Um, you don't have to be a multinational in order for me to be considering. It may investing. even be an industry, right? It could be an industry, exactly. So I do want to look at, you know, the scale of the problem, right? I think mm. all pitch uh, kind of decks are set up in general to focus on the problem initially and then talk about a solution to it. Well, to me, I want to focus on the scalability of the problem. How widespread is the problem that is being solved? And generally speaking, that is an, an element, if you will, of the scale capability that a company has. Um, but in general, I work with a lot of international founders that want to leave the, or at least expand, I should say, beyond their home country and open up opportunities into the U.S. markets. We're a very mm -hmm. consumer spendy kind of uh, economy here in the U.S. And right. so they will want to come over here and tap into that in some way. And so that immediately is, I'm looking at companies that are scaling beyond their borders because they're generally located in some other country and now opening up U.S. opportunities. Right. Um, 
Similarly, I like to work with U.S. opportunities that have potential not just within the U.S. markets, but potentially in other markets. We, even if it's just Canada and Mexico, that's still expansion to me. It opens up a much bigger pie uh, yep. potential. So, yeah, I definitely look at scalability as, as something. And in fact, we discourage lifestyle and service-based businesses from joining Silicon Valley in your pocket, for example. Because mm -hmm. our whole focus is on investor readiness and investors are generally looking for those kinds of scale capabilities. And those two businesses inherently don't have the same degree of scale opportunity. And so right. we kind of, uh, in essence, we discourage them from joining because we feel like they won't be as satisfied as a company that has that in terms mm -hmm. of the way we focus the nature of our curriculum and our, our program. It's geared towards that, uh, that kind of status. Right, right, right. And, and that's, yeah, I, I think that, that you, you sort of also highlighted like who you want as well as who you don't want, right? That's, that's very important to know and, and to discourage those folks because then you end up with unhappy customers and that's the last thing you want. Um, so let, let, let's... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I also want to talk about some winners and losers that you might have in your portfolio and maybe talk about some specific companies. You don't have to share the names if you don't want to because we don't want to embarrass anyone. But uh, uh, it, do, you, do you have some example for us and what you know, actually helped them succeed and what the, their approach was that maybe the losers didn't have? I will, uh, I will share one that's actually down a little bit even further south of you. It's a, it's a technology company, a hardware company, which is generally not my uh, most enthusiastic investments. But mm -hmm. this gentleman um, is with a company named Griffin, Griffin Technologies. Okay. And they make a very um, friendly and easy to control and manage router. So mm. at first I thought, does the world really need a new router? And that was my <laughs> first initial thought. Right. Um, I, I did ultimately buy into the entrepreneur. Um, the founder mm. is a gentleman by the name of John Wu. He's a wonderful founder, a uh, fantastic CEO. He came through one of the accelerator programs, was not um, successful in raising capital from our teams our, of the co-founders, our angel investors, went mm -hmm. on to do a, a crowdfunding, crowd equity uh, fundraising, and uh, broke the bank, raised over $900,000. Wow. And he, he's now, um, you know, post Series A, uh, an eight-figure uh, Series A kind of round. Wow. He's doing spectacular. His business, of course, in COVID, again, going back to our earlier conversation, mm -hmm. people are at home more. They need better internet. Yes. He sells a higher quality router. Um, he's done spectacularly well managing the pivot into the COVID scenario and um, really, really doing very, very well. So I'm thrilled that I jumped in a little bit late in the game, relatively speaking, but I'm thrilled that I was able to jump in and work with him and become an investor in his business and see the success that he's been able to manage. And I think, I think if anything, I will say the common thread of the success stories that I'm going to mention, John and others, is the founder. The, the founder's ability to manage, you know, it's like being in a river in a canoe. You still have to steer the thing. Right. And these folks have been very um, credible and very successful in steering through difficult waters, you know, to stick with my analogy here. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned the uh, Uber for pet owners, if you will. It's a company called SpotOn.Pet. And uh, the founder there, Aparna Srinivasan, um, spectacular uh, entrepreneur. Failure is not an option. She's going to continue to push through any challenges that she's confronted with. She does a very, very um, skilled job in navigating uh, the various aspects of her business. Execution has been tremendous. Um, and again, it, you would have thought it could be a very, very challenging market when all of the ride hailing stopped. Uber yep. and Lyft is obviously two huge names in that space. Probably took an 80 to 90 percent haircut in uh, in New York specifically when mm -hmm. everything shut down. She she dropped maybe 20 percent because she shifted a lot of her business towards um, animal uh, like veterinary practices that needed people needed to get their pets to and from. Yep. And it's astounding the amount of business she's been able to pick up. She's done over 10,000 rides in each of the last several months, just in Manhattan. Wow. And uh, probably 70 plus percent are, are dog only or, or excuse me, pet only. Right. So again, founder been able to very successfully navigate challenging scenarios. And, and I say founder, I'm giving you the name of the, the CEO. They have, they have great teams of people working with them. They have good advisors uh, that help them but they've been able to successfully leverage the resources they have at their disposal to um, make a good proper uh, outcome out of a challenging scenario. Right. But 
that have not been able to do that, um, I think we see different outcomes, much different outcomes. One company, even pre-COVID, was a company I was an investor in. They were expanding from um, uh, Central America. Uh, they had an opportunity to expand into South America. I discouraged it along with another investor who is a colleague of mine, who is a, an advisor and an investor in the same company. We both thought they should stay focused and that, that we, you know, we thought they should try to just continue to grow the market that they were succeeding in. They, uh, uh, but we always say we're advisors. You're the CEO. You know, you have to make the decisions you deem appropriate. This CEO made a decision to do the expansion into South America, and now they have two defunct companies, one in Central America, one in South America. Um, and it was unfortunate. They spread their resources too thin. It never goes as easy and as smoothly as you will think and when you're expanding into a foreign country with a partner. Um, it didn't go well, and it required you know, a lot of travel back and forth, and ultimately both companies, the company and the home country suffered because of the absence of the founder who was trying to you know, support and sustain the uh, expansion country, and both, both of the uh, business operations have failed now. Mm. So, you know, focus, 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 right? People say mm. it all the time, but I do think it's important. This was one where a business was doing a quarter million in revenue um, and growing, and then distracted the focus of the primary operational uh, founder. And, and now, unfortunately, the business is gone. Um, um, so, yeah, there's good stories and bad stories. And um, I take my, it, my, my licks when I, I take my successes, but I take my licks when the ones that don't succeed as well. <laughs> and all we right. can do as investors and advisors is try to offer the best sounding board and guidance that we can. But it is ultimately exactly. the CEO and the team's decision how they <laughs> operate the business. Yeah. And, and I think that the, the advisor role that we serve, I think the one thing that I always like go back to is uh, there's a saying that basically um, good decisions are based on good experience and good experiences are based on failures. Uh, so, you, you, you know, we've sort of gone through that journey. We have made those bad experiences and it's our job to essentially share that with an entrepreneur who may not necessarily have those experiences, right? Um, so they, they, you know, they, this mentality of sort of being able to run through walls is great when, you know, they're expanding and they're actually going in the right direction. But when they're going in the wrong direction, it could be really detrimental to the business. Right? Existential. Exa right, exactly. And that's ex essentially what happened in that example that you gave, right? Uh, that Absolutely. They, they were going to run through walls to expand into countries, but, you know, that, that was the wrong wall to try to run through. You know, interestingly, one of the biggest reasons for failures is expansion too quickly. Right. You spread the resources too thin and now you can't support any of the, you know, the appendages, if you will, or where the tentacles are. And it's, um, I understand the desire. I was an entrepreneur. I had great desires to expand as quickly and rapidly as, and as large as possible. Um, right. But like you said, my experience was really the best thing I could offer at that time. But as I do say about advice, advice is meant to be heard and sometimes taken. So it is right. up to the operating team to decide how best to process the various uh, sources of advice that they're getting. In this particular case, they made a decision that in, in that case went against my advice and that of another advisor. Um, and unfortunately, the businesses were unable to survive. Fantastic. Fantastic. So good. So many good takeaways. But I have one last question for you. And Please. that is, what can the entrepreneur who is looking for funding, what can he do today to get improve their chance of getting the yes from you? Uh, so yeah. how can they improve their chance? Well, I would say any entrepreneur, male, female, any business uh, that wants to come and talk to me, um, the one thing, other than the things we've certainly touched on here, the one thing that I think in entrepreneurs need to do is remember, um, talk to the investors uh, in a way that demonstrates your understanding of the investor's concerns. I cannot mm. tell you how many pitch decks I get that don't have financial forecasts or discuss the exit. I'm an investor. I want to invest in the basis of earning a return. You've got to tell me how I'm going to earn some money one yes. way or the, another. And so I'm always astounded how frequently that happens. The other area that I think in, uh, entrepreneurs uh, struggle with here is valuations um, mm. and raises. So I'll talk about each of them differently. Valuations, first of all, you always want to think it's like saying my baby is beautiful. I understand your baby is beautiful <laughs> and valuable. I get it. 
right. it's only as beautiful and valuable as the person with the money on the other side of the discussion is able to, you know, assess into yep. that. So realize that going in with too high of a valuation is likely to shut you away from investors that could be more than just investors. And that's something I encourage. Don't only look for capital, look for capital that can bring value beyond the capital. So you yes. want investors who bring something to you more than just money. And if you go in with too high of a valuation, they're like, you could very well forego, forego the opportunity to get those people helping you and preclude that opportunity from happening, which is a shame. So yeah. go in with a realistic valuation. If you're pre-revenue and you're coming to me with a $7 million valuation, <laughs> it's going to be a difficult discussion. We're not going to go very far. But if right. you come to me and say, hey, this is where we're headed. This is what I'm willing to take this amount in now. Um, and this is where we're growing, then we can have a productive discussion, not one right. where I'm going to be shut down in the first, you know, early on uh, uh, once I hear the valuation. The other thing that that ties very uh, nicely into is don't raise as much. I often say bifurcate or break out your investment. If you think you need, I'm making up the number, a million and a half to go for the next 18 to 24 months, let's say, come to me and say, I need a million and a half to go for the next 24 months. And here's all the amazing things that million and a half would help us achieve, all of our use of funds and all of the kind of uh, things that we, the accomplishments, if you will, that we're going to knock down by uh, uh, having those funds at our, at our disposal. Right. I understand you don't know us very well and you want to assess our ability to execute. So rather than getting a million five for 24 months, give me 300K. And let me show you in the next 90 days that we can take out these milestones. And if mm -hmm. we do succeed in taking down those milestones in the next 90 days with just your 300K uh, investment, right. then agree that you'll help us with another tranche of investment. And right. help me over the next, say, 12 months raise my million and a half that I need to get me through the next 24 months. Yes. That shows me you understand my concerns around your execution capability. It's, it takes away the sticker shock of, well, a million and a half is a lot of money to put in motion here. How do I kind of get a bite size? I make the analogy that if you ever have been to Costco and you're walking around on the Saturday and they turn a corner and there's someone with a box of taquitos and there's 50 taquitos in that box. Right. You're probably not going to buy the box of 50 taquitos unless they let you sample it. And if exactly. you sample it, you may say, hey, you know what? I can envision eating 50 of these taquitos because I sampled it and it tastes good. Right. So I'm going to buy the box because I got to try it. If you don't get to try it, you're going to walk right by you that. You may not buy it. Yep. That's, and that's so, so similarly, good. entrepreneurs yeah. need to approach investors with that. Let me demonstrate for you my execution capabilities and show you we can take out this subset of milestones in the next 90 days. But I want your commitment now that if we do, you're behind me with the next tranche of money. So I don't have yeah. to be focused on always investing. I want to focus on executing and knocking down milestones. So Absolutely. doing something like that is really going to demonstrate to me, you understand my concerns as an investor generically, and it's going to show me that you know what's important. What's important is execution capability and knocking down productive milestones that move the business forward. Absolutely. That's what's important. And, and, and I think you touch on such a great point where, you know, it, uh, the entrepreneur, the CEO, the founder, whatever you want to call them, they need to have a clear understanding of the finances of the business, right? What their cash burn is, how much that 1.5 is going to actually last them, how much the 300K is going to last them, what they can do, what they can't do. They need to have that clear understanding in order to have an intelligent conversation with someone like you. Uh, and quite frankly, I've seen instances where CEOs will come to me and really not have an understanding of what, you know, what their sales are, what their burn rate is, what their, you know, margins are. And essentially they're saying, well, I need one and a half million because that sounds like a good number. And, and yeah. that, that, that's where the conversation ends. <laughs> so I agree. I agree. But I also think it's okay if you have a CEO that isn't finance oriented. Mm -hmm. Bring your other co-founder who is, yes. bring your CFO. I'm exactly. okay with that, right? But exactly. know that those are important questions that you're touching on, Deval. Yep. You're going to have to get through those conversations, whether you're personally comfortable with them or not. They're still relevant questions that have to be addressed. And you exactly. need to be able to compellingly answer to those questions to the prospective investors in your business. 
Exactly, exactly. And I know on this topic, on what the uh, entrepreneurs can uh, do to actually improve their chance of getting a yes, you've given a whole speech on this, right? Tell me a little bit more about that. <laughs> yeah, this was a presentation, interestingly, that I was invited to present at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, uh, not really what you would call a startup uh, <laughs> environment. But it, it was interesting if you make the analogy that a startup entrepreneur is seeking funding from an investor. It's very similar to an inventor within a, a national laboratory who is seeking project funding from a third party. Now, in their mm. case, they're underneath the auspices of the Department of Energy. So they right. are often applying to people within the Department of Energy for funding. No different mm. than an entrepreneur would be seeking an investor to invest in their business. These guys put together a business plan for a project and seek project funding from someone in one of these other uh, government departments, most often the Department of energy. And right. so I gave a, a presentation on um, what I call your attractiveness quotient. It's how do you make yourself as a business, how do you make your business attractive to investors? And I, um, I presented it to them and we kind of used, uh, we said in the beginning of the presentation, anytime you hear me mention entrepreneur or investor, think about project <laughs> <laughs> creator and project sponsor. Right. And so we just use those terms interchangeably. And that is available on YouTube. You're more than welcome to share that link out Absolutely. to folks. It does relate to, to both. It really was originally created for entrepreneurs and investors more in the vein of how we're having this conversation, right. but it applied very directly to the, on, uh, to the project folks and the inventors within the uh, National Lab up at, at Lawrence. Fantastic, yeah, absolutely. For anyone who is uh, watching or listening, just make sure you look at the description. I'll definitely link uh, that video. And I think that video also has a ton of good, you know, sort of content for you to absorb if you're a startup looking for funding. So I think that that's fantastic. Um, so thank you so much. And by the way, I, I don't know how comfortable you feel about sharing your contact information. Uh, I, I don't want you to get inundated with uh, emails and phone calls uh, and I'm stuff like that. I'm more than happy. You are uh, more than happy. I'm, I'm totally comfortable. You can share out my Silicon Valley in your pocket uh, website, or you can share my email address as you have it. I'm, I'm comfortable if people want to reach out. LinkedIn, I'm very, very much involved on LinkedIn. Okay. And uh, often respond to uh, LinkedIn messages. Um, emails get buried a little bit. LinkedIn, I somehow get to a little more often. <laughs> but, but please feel free to share my contact information. Okay, sure fantastic. Thing. So we'll link everything down below. LinkedIn will be the first link because that's your preferred method. Uh, we'll have the email address on there also. And obviously the website for the Silicon Valley in your pocket. So uh, thank you so much, Jeff, for uh, coming on the show today. I really appreciate your time and uh, participating in this discussion. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll get to have more of these conversations soon. Thanks. That's wonderful. Deval, thank you so much. This was fun. I always enjoy our conversations and I look forward to the next one. Absolutely. Chat soon. Take care, my friend. That was fantastic, Jeff. Thank you so much uh, for doing the interview and uh, teaching us about your process and about what you look for in companies. Um, again, just a couple of things I want to highlight before we end the episode. Um, make sure you click subscribe uh, if you enjoyed this interview and want to receive more content like this. Subscribe button is right below uh, um, and it'll be on screen in a couple of seconds. Um, also, uh, if you are an investor, send me a quick email. Uh, my email address is on the screen now and it's also in the description um, and we'll get you connected to our network. And if you're an entrepreneur and are trying to raise money for your company, get in touch with us. Our website is startupsteroid.com uh, and click on the founder button and uh, fill in that form. Um, so thank you so much for joining me today and I will see you in the next one. Bye.